Dear friends and family in the Lord, may you know the peace and joy of that the Lord is always present with us. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for coming and dwelling among us this day, that as we enter into your house, uh, may our worship be truly pleasing in your sight. Lord, we pray that as uh, the times that when our worship fails and falters, that we would know that you are always there, that, uh, that although we turn our back, you never do. May this be our assurance. May this be our promise. May this be our hope now and forevermore. This we pray in your Son, Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the author and uh, British theologian by the name of C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Lewis died in 1963, but before he died, he contributed a great deal to Christianity, contributed a great deal to our understanding of God and understanding of his love for us. C.S. Lewis, as many of you may be aware, maybe not, it was an atheist for some time in his life. From the time of night uh, that he was 15 years old till, uh, till he was an adult, he was an atheist. But in 1929, after many years, the Lord worked on his heart. The Lord brought him to faith, and after that, he wanted everyone to receive that same gift of faith. And so many of you maybe are familiar with that. He wrote the books, The Chronicles of Narnia. Has anybody read those books, Chronicles of Narnia, before? Well, if you've read those books, you realize that what C.S. Lewis is trying to do is make Christianity accessible to the average person, to make it accessible to, the, to a child, to adults alike. And one of my favorite lines in those books, and, and Lewis does this in other places too, but is in the first book, which is actually the last book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The last one he wrote, but it's the first one that's in the series. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you follow with the Pevensey children as they discover the land of Narnia. And they discover this lion by the name of Oslin. Well, there is a mythical character, Mr. Beaver, who Susan Pevensey, one of the children, she asks when she finds out about Oslin, well, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver responds, and this is such a great line, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And what an interesting way to look at the Lord, isn't it? Because that's exactly what, who Oslin represented. He represented, that lion represented Jesus, represented the Lord among us. In fact, so much so that in this lion, the witch in the wardrobe, the lion was put to death for, on behalf of the children and resurrected, much like our Lord representative of the Lord. He's not safe, but he's good. He's the king. What a way to look at the Lord. What a way to think about our God, especially as you think about the disciples' experience, Peter, James, and John, as they were up on the mountain that day. I imagine that, as the Scripture tells us, that they were trembling. They were thinking to themselves, is he safe? We know he's good. We know he's the king, but is he safe? Certainly, they were not the first to wonder that. Moses and Elijah, they stood before the presence of the Lord, also on top of mountains, also gripped by fear, wondering that same question, is he safe? Is our God safe? Something that as we come into his presence, I wonder how often we think about. I wonder how often as we enter into the house of the Lord, as we enter into a time of prayer with Him, time of worship before Him, do we reflect on that question? Is He safe? Can our God be tamed? Well, we know that there's one difference between Moses and Elijah and Peter, James, and John. And right after they fell to their knees in fear, Jesus walked over them and He touched them, it says. And He told them, do not be afraid. Can our Lord be tamed? Jesus, he tames the fears that we have. He tames the, the judgment of our God. He is the one. But, you know, as Jesus touched him that day, as he showed him that compassion, it was more than just preparing them for that moment, reassuring them that he was safe in that moment, reassuring them that they were okay at that time. But it was more than that because just before this, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had told the disciples, he had foretold his death, he had told them, it's coming. And that would stop any of us in our tracks, wouldn't it? If we had heard that very message, been there right there, and witnessed that, those words of Jesus that he was going to die, and it was going to be brutal, wouldn't it stop us too? So Jesus' touch, his words of do not be afraid, it was more than just that momentary comfort. It was intended to prepare him for the week ahead, the, the time ahead. That same compassion is the same compassion our Lord shows to us. 
That same compassion which even outshines the transfiguration. God reaching out to His people, reaching into our lives, changing our lives. Our great God is a great and mighty God, a wondrous God. But, and, and maybe maybe we have wrestled with that question of whether or not He's safe. And maybe we've wrestled with that and wondered if, if we can in fact tame Him, if we can in fact stop Him, if we are able to do so. Well, maybe we don't ask that question that way. Maybe we don't think about it in those words or by those lines, but maybe in our lives sometimes we think God should think like I think. God should do what I would do. God should obey what I would want Him to do. And that's the God for me. God should be tamed by my will, bend to my commands. If I need help with my finances, well, God should want to help me. He is, after all, a loving God. If God wants me to share my love with fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ, then He should repair my relationships. He should fix my marriage. He should fix my family. If God is so gracious and good, and He should make this world turn to Him. Show them a little bit of that glory so that they too might fall on their knees. But that's not how God works, is it? God doesn't just bend to our whim. He's not tamed by our thoughts, by our sinful hearts. That's not how God operates. And sometimes when He doesn't, sometimes I think our worship falters and it falls. It withers. It will even at times dry up. When God doesn't do what we want Him to do, when He doesn't fix our broken bodies and broken relationships and broken lives, our worship stumbles and falls. God, if you're not going to do it for me, then I'm not going to be there for you. Where are you, God, in this whole mess? And instead of fearing God, instead of looking at our God with awe and amazement, thinking about this is the God who created the entire universe by not His hand, but by His very words, we look at Him and we say, God, where were you when I needed you most? And our worship, it falters. It becomes about us. We break the first commandment. It's not as though we're worshiping other gods, worshiping idols, but we want to take that place of God. We want to tell Him what His will should be. Instead of saying, Thy will be done, we say, My will be done. I'm sure, we don't say those words, but how many times in our lives, how many times in your life have you wondered why God did not step in when you thought He should? when He should have stepped in and fixed that. So many times we feel we lift up our prayers. So many times we lift up our hymns and our, our songs of praise and we feel like, where is the answer to this question? Where is it God's answer? We want Him to be tamed by us. We want His will to be in line with ours and that's not how God works, so is it? That's not how God works with His creation, with His people, because He has a divine plan that is greater than our plan, greater than our little insignificant lives. Except to God, our lives aren't insignificant, are they? And although we feel like sometimes He's not there, or some, though we feel sometimes He's not listening, as I told the kids, He is always present. Isn't that the beauty of the transfiguration? It wasn't just a beautiful light show or uh, a nice uh, sound effects that, uh, from the voice from heaven. No, this was a beautiful happening that God said, no, I am present with you now. I'm going to be present with you later, and I'm going to be present with you every single day of your life. The good days, the bad days, the hard days, the easy days, the happy days, and the sad days, He's there with you. That is who our God is. Your life is not insignificant to Him. Even if at times you feel like your life is insignificant. Even if it feels like you do not have a voice before the Lord. He is always listening. He is always there because you are His children. You are there. You are His because He was there in your baptism. He was present in that water and the Word as it was spoken. And He has made you His very own. You know, it's sometimes... Sometimes it's, you know, we, we get so focused on transfiguration that we forget about that other mountain that's not so far away. It's that mountain of Calvary. You know, on that mountain of Calvary, Christ was there too. But He was there in a different way, wasn't He? 
Instead of being there as, as, as to gently touch his disciples, he was there to have his hands pounded into a cross. Instead of being there to, to, to speak those words, do not be afraid. He spoke those words, I forgive you. Because on that Mount of Calvary, he offered the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice for every one of our sins. Those times when we question his presence, those times when we question how much he cares, he shows us right then and there that greatest gift of compassion and love of all time, the giving of his own body and soul for us. And that's who our God is. That's who we come to worship. Worship, in one sense, it is about us because God's present. He sustains us and he supports us. But truly, who is worship about? It is about God. It is about coming into the presence of the holy God, the almighty God, the glorious God, and thanking and praising him for all the amazing things he's done in our lives, all the things that he does for us each and every day. But most of all, that in that death on the cross, on that mountain of Calvary, he promised that he was also going to give us life on another mountain. And that is Mount Zion. Now in Scripture, Mount Zion, that's, that's code, by the way. That's life eternal with Him in heaven. That's the promise that we're going to have, that we're going to be with Him forever. Because that's what He won for us on the cross. That's what that surrender was worth. It didn't end in death, but it ended in our lives. Life eternal for, with Him, just as He rose from the grave. And so when we come into this house, when we, go, when we go from this house, we're in the presence of our Lord. When we enter in, we lift up voices and songs of praise. We confess our sins. We hear the absolution. We join together in the holy meal of the Lord's Supper. And we give thanks because it is our God who comes and cares enough about our insignificant lives to see us as significant. It is our God who comes and dwells among us, who loves us, and leads us through all times. But he doesn't want us to just stay here. He doesn't just want us to wait and wait for the day when we will be lifted up to that mount with him forever in heaven. He wants us to go forth. Just as the disciples and Jesus, they didn't stay on top of the mountain, did they? Peter, James, and John, and Jesus himself, they went down the mountain. And Jesus gave them a command to go out. Go out into the world. Not right then, but once he rose, and he's rose, risen, folks, but to go out and share that gospel message, to go out and share that promise, to go out and bring it to the very ends of the earth, to bring it to people who smell different than we are, who look different than we are, who maybe didn't sleep in a comfortable bed like we did last night, to go out there and to proclaim that good news message that Jesus Christ has died on the cross, but he did not remain there but has risen. That God is present with us. And when we go out, we are not alone. But we go forth with the presence of God. When we come together in this house, we sit, we kneel before the Lord. And in a very real way, He comes to us in His body and blood. He gives us the strength and nourishment we need to go forth, to proclaim that good news, to go forth and tell others that God is with them, that God loves them, that God is willing to forgive them. Our God, it's true, we, we can't tame him. But would you really want to? Would you really want to stop the God, our God, the true God, who changes this world every single day, who changes this world by his presence, who leads this world and has a plan for each and every one of us and for every person in this world? I don't think so. Our God, he's dangerous. But he's good. He is the king. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to you for sending your son Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for his sacrifice on the cross, for his bitter sufferings and death, so that we might have forgiveness for our sins. We pray, Lord, that as, we, as often as we come together in worship of you, that we would reflect on what it means to be present in your house, to reflect on what it means to be present with you, our King. Lord, help us each day to, to know that our worship is not all about us, but it is about you. Help us each day to know that our worship is not about when we feel good or when life is going our way, but it's for every day. 
and that in our worship you strengthen us, that you nourish us, and that you lead us. Lord, we pray that as we go forth, that we would go forth with your presence, that we would share your love with others, that we would share the good news that you are the king, that even now you prepare a place for us, your children. In all things we pray through Jesus Christ, our transfigured Lord and Savior. Amen.